Hey, it's former Jeopardy contestant Claire Fisher, and I love making fun of MacGyver because what the world really needs right now is more sophomoric sex jokes. Tonight, MacGyver's pretty pal Penny Parker gets the lead part in a new musical, but could it just be a trap set by Max Arch Nemesis? Join Sam, Jeff, and special guest host Eamon from Philadelphia and see if you can stomach making fun of MacGyver. It's making fun of MacGyver. A rib-tickling takedown of our favorite 80s adventure show, Cops. <laughs> no, it's MacGyver. Starring your official MacGyver ambassadors, Sam Jordan and Jeffrey Hess. Name's MacGyver. Welcome everybody to Making Fun of MacGyver. It's the show where we recap, review, and lovingly ridicule every episode of the original series. I'm Sam Jordan, your host. And as usual, I'm joined by my fellow MacGyver, right? The grizzled star of stage and screen, Jeffrey Hess. You knew I was in like plays and musicals all through high school, right? No, not when I wrote that. All these years and you've never once gotten theater kid energy off of me? <laughs> Are you serious? Let's delve further into that as the night goes on. Oh, this, this, this show, I don't, you want to talk about theater. You, you've got theater in this show. And, but today, Jeff, we're joined by uh, the fresh-faced Broadway newcomer, Eamon from Philadelphia. How's it going, everyone? <laughs> it's going well. Welcome. Uh, hey, my dashing duo of dynamic and driven dudes, serious question now. Are you prepared? To see more old bald men basting in a steam-filled room than your local YMCA? You know, his suit was impeccable the whole time. Eamon, you ready for Sweaty Pete? <sighs> sweaty Pete's a classic. He's not even sweaty. <laughs> he doesn't get sweaty. sweaty. There's some, a little you bit of sweat. You think there's sweat? I think uh, so. Well, they missed at him? <laughs> well, in certain areas of his body, I'm, I'm guessing there's sweat closer to the, oh. the flames. Yeah, which is nice and smooth after his shaved cubes. All right, great, because we're moments away from our 98th episode and it's the 73rd episode of macgyver we're consuming and tonight we're breaking down macgyver season four episode nine cleo rocks, cleo rocks. but first it's our opening gambit see what i did there jeff uh trying to find a song that goes that says cleo rocks i just took it yep from it's the, the song from the show yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. easy but uh, so this is exciting. We've got a patron here. Um, and if you come in at the Swiss Army Knife tier, which is the highest tier, it's $15 a month. Again, you could just do one month and bail and you're still going to get the perks. But uh, if you come in at the $15 Swiss Army Knife tier, patreon.com slash making fun of MacGyver, you get to choose an episode that you want to guest host with us. And uh, this is what Eamon from Philadelphia, who's been a patron about, what would you say, about four or five months now? Maybe five, six months? Like Give that? or take, since last fall. He's here and he's exciting. He's from Philadelphia. Eamon, welcome to the show. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I, I would second off what Jeff said. I am also what one might call a recovering theater kid. I, <laughs> I graced the stage a time or two in high school. I'm originally from... Northeast Iowa. I went to college in Minnesota at Gustavus Adolphus. I'm finishing my master's of public health at Drexel University in Philadelphia right now. I also work as a teaching assistant there and I work at Philadelphia Runner, which is a really cool little run store across the Philadelphia area. And having heard all that, there's a 100% chance you were gifted and talented in a high school or elementary school. Elementary school. <laughs> elementary? Did they have that? Does they have that in elementary? They called it talented and gifted. There. Yes. Yeah. And you were? <laughs> yeah. Once, once upon a time. Yeah. Were? You're not still talented and gifted? We'll find out tonight. <laughs> no, it's a whole arc for people just like me. We're in all that stuff. And then we hit about 28 and really just like fall off the cliff. <laughs> it goes all to shit. I went to grad school. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought up his age. Because when we first met him, and we've hung out with him a couple of times on the monthly hangout, so uh, we, we're not just getting to know Eamon. We've hung out a couple of times, and we were shocked by how young he is. Uh, I guess the first thing we were shocked by that he's a triathlete, does triathlons, 
But then he's also, I think he's our second youngest listener. You don't have to say your age. Do you want to say your age? If not, I'll, I'll allude to it. Do you want to avoid I, the age? I'm 24. 24, right. I was thinking we had that young lady, Esther, from Virginia or West Virginia a couple of years ago. And I think now she's 18 or 19. You can't top that. That still boggles the mind. But uh, I don't think we've ever heard from someone in their early, you know, or even mid 20s. So Vivian from Taiwan. You're forgetting about your... Oh, your, Vivian from Taiwan. It says 22. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, you're, third, you're our third youngest. And this, this novelty is wearing off as, as we <laughs> find out more people. <laughs> um, but, but people, you know, the typical listener for us in their 40s, uh, maybe 50s, they're wondering maybe how someone 23, 24 gets into MacGyver. What's your MacGyver story? Uh, brief synopsis of me and MacGyver. Uh, my younger brother and I got into MacGyver at least for me, based off the uh, the MacGyver Myths Mythbusters episode. And our mm-hmm. public library had every episode, season one, season seven, on DVD. And so we'd pull up in the summer, grab a DVD or two, run it down, go get the next one. And all of a sudden, I'm like, man, I really look up to this this guy that I have a parasocial fatherhood relationship with. <laughs> Yeah, big fan of MacGyver, though. Awesome. Jeff, doesn't that sound like the ideal way MacGyver would want you to discover his show, like at the public library and doing this? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's where most adventures start for MacGyver. You can (laughs) hang out there and find out about ancient Indian burial grounds. But I can see Henry Winkler and Lee David Zlodoff loving that story about a 20 or 17, 18 year old, whatever, a few years ago. Loving MacGyver, going to the public class. That's, that's great. That's awesome. But welcome. You're excited to, and you've chosen, why did you choose uh, Cleo Rocks tonight? It'll it'll become apparent as the episode goes on, but there is, <laughs> there's a lot, of, a lot of crossover between characters from the past that we might encounter in this episode. So when we had Mia from Australia on and she picked the episode where they like travel cross country with this guy in this big red convertible. And she said the same thing. Sam was like, why'd you pick it? She's like, uh, just, you'll see. <laughs> well, it's a fun episode. It's going to be a fun time with you here tonight. And um, again, thank you so much for your support. We're glad to hang out with you again. Hey, reminder, the first ever Making Fun of MacGyver meetup is happening in Vancouver, British Columbia in the first week of June. And uh, we put a post on social and some people said, yeah, they're they're into it. So this thing is real. We haven't booked a place yet. We haven't, me, Jeff or I haven't booked airfare yet or anything like that. But this is, oh, Jeff's taking a train. But this is happening. And you know what? This is a rumor. There's a rumor. My, I think Mike saw, uh, you know, the few posts, uh, you know, people commenting and ooh, he got a little jealous. Mike said, you know what? Maybe I might be able to find a way there. So Mike, you never know, could possibly <laughs> find a way there. Okay. Uh, Vern, Bigfoot, it's going to be a fun time. And we're going to yep. try and, you uh, know. Is Archibald, is Archibald coming? I don't think Archibald from Pittsburgh will be there, uh, but you never know. You never know. What about Steubens and Marlowe? Oh, you know what? I'm glad you mentioned it because uh, we haven't said them for about three episodes in a row there, by the way. That's not true. I, I thought them. You thought them. Yeah, but that's on you. Yeah. It's usually your job to say that. But I know. Um, so, yeah. So stay tuned for more details on that. But we're looking at like June 1, 2, 3, 4. It would probably be in those days, maybe five. And if you can get to Vancouver, we're just going to hang out with anyone that wants to hang out and we're going to go look at some filming locations and drink and record a few shows and eat and be merry. So uh, stay tuned for more details on that. Hey, uh, the making fun of MacGyver hotline, it's done. It was a Google number and you know, Google numbers like every couple months are like, Hey, you still using this number? And then you gotta, you gotta make a text or you gotta make a call. So I would keep doing that. And then they finally put me to my limit. I said, you know what? Nah. So um, the Making Fun of MacGyver hotline, <laughs> rest in peace. We had a good five or six calls on it over the two years that we had it. The best being Pia from uh, North Dakota with that limerick. Yep. Oh, my God, that was great. But uh, please yeah. don't call the Making Fun of MacGyver hotline anymore. I don't know what you'll get there. Uh, but there's plenty of ways to get in touch with us. It's always Making Fun of MacGyver wherever. It's Fun of Mac on Twitter. I'm not sure how much longer we'll be on Twitter, but we're there. Instagram now. The YouTube channel. And um, making fun of MacGyver at gmail.com is like the best way. If you want to just say something direct to us, personal, or record a little audio clip in your phone and send that as a file, that's the way to do it. If you want to get your voice on on the show without really being a guest, do that. Send us an email and an audio clip to making fun of MacGyver at gmail.com. Uh, one more final note in the opening gamut section. I'm being told, Jeff, we are being preempted tonight, unfortunately, near the end of the show for a sneak preview of a new show 
that's coming to this network. I don't know much about it. I don't know if we're just supposed to get out of the studio at some point, but I'm being told it's unique. It's must-see podcast stuff, which is kind of an oxymoron, a must-see mm. podcast. But uh, stick around for that. That's all I've been told about the, that show. I hope it's ALF. <laughs> I mean, ALF is already a property. This is a new show. It's not oh, a, oh, it's yeah. a new thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, man, you've heard this sweet sound many times before on tape delay. As you're jogging, you're bicycling, you're swimming, you've heard this, but you've never heard this live. Brace yourself now for the viewer mail theme. Okay, I gave you 10 seconds to say if it was too short. He did not take the bait. <laughs> Neither of you took the bait. I want to see if we could eclipse that famous pause with, uh, with you and Mike. A you could have had ago. twins in that pregnant in the how pregnant that pause was. <laughs> and I'm gonna leave that in there. I thought Eamon's gonna say too short. You might say too nobody said a damn thing. And I guess you're looking at me to see because you think maybe I'm wondering if the tech is right over here, or either that or you just froze up during the headlights thing. But <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> or you think it's perfect. Or it wasn't too long, it wasn't too short, it was perfect. No, I mean it was fine. It's fine. It was God, fine. fine. I needed time to decide. So a couple of comments here. On Spotify. So, you know, if you listen on Spotify, if you go to the app, then after each episode, there's a question that says, hey, what'd you think of the episode? Let us know. And if you want to comment on that episode, say it's good or bad or whatever, um, you can do that on each episode and then we'll publish it and you can see those comments somewhere. So we did get a comment, one comment last, uh, a couple weeks ago on the Deadly Dreams episode. Loved that one. By number one star Scream fan. And he simply wrote, peak podcast. That's all. He just wrote Peak Podcast by number one Star Scream fan. So thank you yep. for that. That was nice. This is what peak performance looks like, ladies and gentlemen. You may not like this. <laughs> also, Tom Shepard, a uh, new listener to us, but um, says he's been listening for a while, writes us on Facebook, and he says, Gents, stoked that you guys are coming to Vancouver. I've been listening to your show since the sixth episode, and I'm glad you guys survived the loss of your third leg, the death of many a great podcast. I will be definitely checking out any events you organize. If you need help with anything on the ground, I live in Vancouver, would be happy to help. My way of showing my gratitude for three years of content and not paying. I at least got a beer for Sam and a joint for Jeff. Thanks again for all your hard work and look forward to seeing you in the flesh. Signing off from Soon Parts Headquarters, Tom. That's someone who listens. That's a lot of lore. First time caller, long time listener. That's cool. <laughs> I know, right? Long time listener. And hey, don't worry, Tom. I still got my third leg. We're good. Oh, snap. You going to take him up on that free oh, hell yeah. marijuana cigarette? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for that because this is the kind of stuff that really keeps us going. You know, someone like really enjoying it and uh, letting us know. So we look forward to seeing you and we might need you to set up some stuff in Vancouver because we might have enough people to... Go to an establishment and, I don't know, put a projector up on the wall and watch Trumbo's World as we're riffing on it or something like that. So we might need your help with that. Boots on the ground already in Vancouver. This is exciting. Thank you, Tom, for that. Guys, let me take you back now. 35 years, almost to the day, to Monday, February 6th, 1989. Now, we've been doing this show almost four years, Jeff, and we always look at the number one song and the number one movie. And I think this could be the most forgettable week of popular entertainment we've ever encountered in these, these four years, as far as your two number ones. The number one movie in the country is Three Fugitives. Does that ring a bell to anybody? No, it didn't ring a bell to me, and I was the oldest one. And I'm a fan of one of the stars here. It's a crime comedy film written and directed by Francis Weber, starring Nick Nolte and Martin Short. I love Martin Short. It's a remake of Lace Fugitifs, a 1986 <laughs> French comedy starring Gerard Depardieu. That sounds exactly um, like something Martin Short's involved in. Yeah. Are you, do you, uh, uh, don't wait. Are you dissing Martin Short? Sounds like you might be dissing. Yeah, it's a, a mild diss at Martin Short. Yes. Oof. I'm not even going to entertain that. We got too much, too bigger fish to fry. I'm not going to take you up on that that bait. The film follows a former notorious bank robber who, on the day he gets out of prison, is randomly taken hostage by another inexperienced bank robber while trying to cash his prison check, leading the police to assume he is behind it. A series of amusing situations ensues as the squabbling pair tries to evade capture. It's just so rare for me to see a number one movie that I've never heard of. You know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. less rare for you. And I'm, what was of the course, week? I don't stand Eamon. The week is February, early February of 89. There you go. Yeah, that's that's your prototypical February release. 
This yeah. is probably the only movie that came out that week. It's cold. <laughs> Nobody's going to the theater. Sold yeah. like sold like eight tickets to thirty nine theaters, and that's how it's number one. Uh, the number one song in the country is almost as forgettable as that movie because the group behind it certainly, and the group the group behind it certainly is. The song is called "When I'm With You," a power ballad by Canadian arena rock band Sheriff. <laughs> what? Like, yeah, Jeff. Now, Mike, Mike might have known this, but he's not here tonight. Uh, but when you hear it, when I heard this song, I'm like, okay, I I know this song, but I did not know Sheriff did it. And I can tell you who definitely wouldn't know a song. A 23, 24-year-old from originally from Iowa is not going to know when I would. Eamon, prove me wrong. Did you, had you ever heard this song before? Man, I I like music that is older than I am in general, but this song just <laughs> so far over my head. <laughs> far over your head in what way? Just I had no idea. I didn't even know Sheriff existed. <laughs> I no, I'm, I'm, that's what I'm telling you. I'm telling you, like, I was there. I lived through it, and I did not know who Sheriff was. Um, the song was released in January of 83 in Canada as the second single from their self-titled album. It was a top 10 hit in Canada in 83 and a minor U.S. hit at the same time. <clears throat> then the song later reaches number one in the United States six years later, four years after the band separated in 1985. And we've had this kind of thing happen before. <laughs> How awesome is that? Like your band breaks up and like four years later, fat royalty checks start rolling in off some random well, song. True. You haven't yeah, done anything. Yeah. You're just sitting there and all of a sudden, hey, look, there's an extra money right there. So Eamon's going to sing it and it builds for a long time. So so good luck with that. Um, actually, I'll tell you, I'll save the fascinating factoid for after. Okay. So Eamon, how are you feeling about making your singing debut? You said you got some theater chops in you. Did you do much singing on stage ever? Once upon a time. Okay. Little little bit of this, little bit of that. Good luck with this. Me and Jeff are just gonna sit back. I've got some apple slices and peanut butter, and do your best with this baby. I needed love like I need you, and I never lived for nobody. I live for you, ooh baby. This is love. What I feel when I'm with you. <laughs> it is the way you touch me, the warmth of the sun. Maybe it's the way you smile. Come on, I'm done. Ooh, baby, lost in love is what I feel. Tremendous. That was tremendous. What do you think, Jeff? Uh, at first, I wasn't understanding it, and then the drums kicked in, and I get it. That's uh, that's music that's an experience. Do you get the power of that performance by Eamon? Yeah. I'm moved. Yeah. I'm moved by Would all you, of it. Raw sensuality, or was it more like cooked, sizzling hot sensuality was coming through? Uh, yeah, it was like radiant, effervescent <laughs> personality. I mean, he, he you could just see all. him on stage, single, yeah. alone, in the spotlight with the guitar. Oh, oh yeah, girls would go crazy. How'd you feel with that I'm performance, Eamon? You, you happy with it? I'm trying to try my best to run away from my past as an acoustic guitar guy in high school. Ooh. Oh the, no, the power oh. ballad didn't help with that. <laughs> <laughs> Not gonna lie. You're my wonder wall. <laughs> well, uh, I you did a great I hope job, it was but never uh, that bad. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we're all not done yet because here's the factoid I wanted to say. The Guinness uh, World Records li lists When I'm With You as having the longest held vocal note in a U.S. hit single ever. <laughs> Features a note timed at 19.3 seconds by lead singer Federico Freddie Kirchi, who performed the soaring vocal. The song is also notable that it was one of the few number one hits to not have a promotional video during the MTV era. So this is the, the 19 seconds. I'm going to play you this cut. All right. 
And then after, okay. all three of us are going to take a crack at holding a note <laughs> for 19.3 seconds. Oh, this is this is cheating. <laughs> I'm not even fair. So first, let's let's play this cut. This is not it. This is not it. And this isn't it, but it comes up right after this. This? We're supposed to emulate this for 19 seconds? Uh, <laughs> come on. Is this fake? This is... What is going on? What the? It's still going? Ugh. <laughs> uh. Federico Kirchi. I don't know if I'm going to make it through the like the the vocal flourish. Jeff, why don't you just try and hold any note, something like Let's that. Go. When I'm with you, and then just try, just try when I'm with you. <clears throat> See how long you can hold when I'm with you. Okay, <clears throat> here we go. <sighs> when I'm with you. timing that's got to be at least 10 seconds i was really struggling at the end <laughs> there was a little drop in there i thought maybe you snuck a breath in but no nope. okay wow Impressive. just squeezing it out breathe through the diaphragm all right i can't do that <clears throat> i'll try <laughs> I, 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 I have to say when i'm with i just i just want to say the you part when i'm with you Pretty good. Twelve Sorry. seconds. That's about. I had it right, on the Amen. watch. <laughs> okay, it's up to you. Let's see if you can go for the record. When I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I'm not expecting that. Keep going, keep going. You no, almost have the record. This is the theater kid. This is theater kid energy right here, Sam. Oh my God, he's still going. How's he doing this? I don't know. I think there's like a pump organ somewhere. You know how Yanni does oh circular God. breathing and like he can just keep a held note on it. I think it's like that. He's over 30 seconds, Jeff. Yeah, it's a. It's, what the it's, hell's going on? I don't know, but. Hey, should, you okay? Stop it. She stopped. Should we send an ambulance? <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, there he goes. Finally, oh my God, that new world hey, record wow. there by Amos. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Unexpected. <laughs> I mean, you were like, "Oh, I do some uh, some musical theater in the past," and then he's like, "Turns you out he's actually blow that us guy. away with that." That was amazing. Congrats! All right, so we've got a Guinness World Record set. Uh, it's Monday, February sixth, nineteen eighty nine, and at eight o'clock that night on ABC. It's MacGyver Season 4, Episode 9, Cleo Rocks. Cleo Rocks! And uh, now I hand over the reins of the episode to the next level of MacGyver narrators, the gentleman, Jeffrey Hess. I grew up an only child, no brothers or sisters. But somehow, Penny Parker brings out the big brother in me anyway. She's the kind of girl who needs, well, looking after. Ever since I've known Penny, and that's going back a while, she's been trying to break into show business. When she landed the role in a new musical, I was the first one she called with the news. I couldn't resist her invitation to drop in on a rehearsal. Besides, it never hurts to get a little culture in your life. We open Axminster 1 where Mac is introducing us to the fact that this is a Penny Parker episode. Ah, MacGyver. Let the show begin. So then um, he walks into the theater and a musical number begins. And this episode's got a musical number in it starring Terry Hatcher. <laughs> she looks good. But you know who doesn't look good? Her henchmen. Her hunky henchmen dancers. Because once again, <laughs> and I've got a real beef here. Because once again, they've tapped into probably Vancouver's finest. 
And when you have a hot woman come out like Terry Hatcher and is treated like Cleopatra, like royalty, and you've got guys bearing their chests as her two dancers, they've got to be beefy studs. And they look like they look like local theater nerds. It is terrible. It is terrible. I mean, is this a sexy song and dance number or a Sally Struthers PSA for starving orphans? That's that's what I'm, I'm asking you guys right now. So definitely not Terry Hatcher singing this, though, right? No. Okay. Yeah, I didn't think so. I've seen sexier men in a mausoleum, guys. Seriously. <laughs> she sli- the last guy slides through his legs. I've seen more beefcake in a veggie burger, Jeff. Eamon, I've seen bigger hunks on a cheese platter. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I mean, I've seen more alpha males on Nerd Night at the comic book store. You know that night, Jeff. Oh, yeah. You're there every yep. Wednesday, every yep. Tuesday. Yep. Guys, no, I'm really angry about this. I've seen more testosterone in a tube of Toblerone. Oh. I'm really angry about this. You know what? And I think I could do a better. Give me a sec. I think I could do a better job than this. I really okay. do. Give me, give me. Hold on a sec. Hang on. You better come back with. You better. If you hear me, you bastard. You better come back with a wig <laughs> on. Is he gonna go wig or bare chest? I'm expecting like full Egyptian garb. Oh my gosh. I'm thinking like bare chest, but like with like the pharaoh <laughs> you, kind you of got like it. bars. <laughs> oh my god. Come on, tell me the. Tell me this isn't better, Jeff. <laughs> tell me I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> So Sam is dancing shirtless. Get this man on a stage. <laughs> He's got some kind of like scarf on. What's he got? What is that around his neck, Eamon? I don't know. <laughs> oh, look at that. Oh, he's now he's sexy eating. He's, he's sexy eating apples. And no, he's no, he's rubbing the peanut butter on his belly, but it's never getting out. That is Oh, oh man. <laughs> Banish this man to the sarcophagus. <laughs> oh, listeners, you're lucky. Uh, he's gone now. Okay, he's back. So I don't even know why Sam has uh, like uh, Egyptian garb. <laughs> Anything for the kids. Anything you, for the gram. That's selling out. That's head first slide into home. Knowing the collision's coming. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. So, uh, so so did I not do a better job? On? Who was sexier, yes. me or these two? Okay. No, Definitely. you, obviously. Yeah. The the apple in the belly button, that's the surefire winner. So, they did that back anyway. in ancient uh, Egypt. <laughs> Mac walks on to uh, Mac walks on to stage and he's talking with Petty Parker, who's in her full Cleopatra outfit, and <laughs> uh, a director names Jock LaRue comes screaming out from the, the wings and he rolls out an electric wheelchair and what is this accent <laughs> is it french you tell us it german? you chose the damn oh episode. my goodness i i had i made like a little notes doc of this episode and the first thing i put when enter enter larue is silly fake accent yeah. <laughs> i don't know what so, accent <laughs> it's vaguely european Depending on what scene and who he's talking to, it changes. Um, <laughs> Later on, he does say Monsieur MacGyver. So yeah. French, I guess. And LaRue would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So a producer named Wintergreen confronts him. And Wintergreen is really pissed off because the production is like bankrupting the theater. And the theater needs this thing to, to succeed. Um, without warning, part of the set breaks and nearly oh, falls and hits Penny Parker. Like oh, it's this huge sign and it swings down and Mac runs over and knocks her out of the way just in time to save her life. Close one. Yeah. You know what? It's not the only what? time either because LaRue and Penny no. say a lot of strange things have been happening and mm. LaRue speculates that Wintergreen is behind it and he's trying to sabotage the show. I like, I know we didn't get to this part yet, but I might forget <laughs> the spot later in the show when, when they're trying to give you one last red herring moment that it, Wintergreen could be the bad guy and he's watching Penny and LaRue do their thing and he's standing so creepily in the shadows and then he like does the homer simpson back into the bushes <laughs> and goes back into the darkness like no one would ever do that in real life the way he just moved backwards like that but yeah so he's being set up as uh, this guy could be uh the villain oh, but okay so so amen you saw this episode for the first time maybe seven years ago jeff you just saw this for the first time this week recently a few days ago yeah uh when you first see larue are you thinking that's who we're gonna find out it is are you seriously asking me this? <laughs> yeah. I watched okay. this episode and I thought, if Sam doesn't ask me if I recognize him, he doesn't know me. Of course I don't recognize him. Okay, you didn't recognize no. that. Okay. <laughs> You're like, this, this guy's got big eyebrows and a weird nose, but okay. And like, I don't generally watch the credits either, so I didn't see that Michael DeBar was in it, but I figured it out. Mm. 
I figured it out before MacGyver did. <laughs> he wrote this. So he composed the lyrics to Cleo Rocks, by the way. Oh. Michael DeBar did. <laughs> oh, wait. In real life? Yeah, in real life. He's a rock star kind of guy. He had some hits with the, a band. Oh, my God. Yeah. I love episode with good lore. I also did not. The disguise fooled <laughs> me. I it was LaRue to my middle school <laughs> person when I first saw this episode. Well, had you seen other episodes, other Murdoch episodes? Oh, yeah. This was season four. I'd seen, like, all of the ones leading up to it. Yeah, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, if you'll recall from earlier episodes, Murdoch is supposed to be horribly scarred on one side of his face. LaRue mm-hmm. is notably unscarred. Unscarred enough mm-hmm. to have captured the heart of Penny Parker. Yeah. So Mac and Penny do a walk and talk and they talk about how the set is cursed. Well, it doesn't sound like this place is too safe. Oh, there's more to it than that. And some of the stage crew's even saying that the show has a jinx on it. Poor Jacques. Mr. Wintergreen isn't making it any easier on him. Your concern for old Jacques wouldn't be a little more than professional, would it? Well, <laughs> we've been working so closely. He's such a fascinating man. Penny, I thought you swore off showbiz relationships. Oh, well, this isn't show business. It's theater. This was before the, uh, the sign that, like, the overhanging sign that fell on the stage. Uh, but I, there was a great line when Penny ran over to see MacGyver when he first walked on stage. And she said something along the lines of, oh, I know I was so slow coming out of that esophagus. To which Max says sarcophagus <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. and i i just felt that need to mention it <laughs> yeah no, that's a little bit of humor there yep penny still pen, the voice is down so now it's confirmed the crazy high voice from the, her first one or two appearances is down but the ditziness still there <laughs> so they go to the penny's dressing room and someone has sent her flowers that's nice but they're not just any flowers no no it's not oh. nice them's Dead Roses, Them's baby. Dead Roses, baby. Okay, I think that yep. was the name of uh, Michael DeBar's second album. Them's Dead Roses, yeah. baby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and LaRue rolls in. I love it. He rolls everywhere. It's funny. <laughs> and tells Penny that they're going to rehearse in private. The seduction mm. number. Oh, boy. Casting couch. You, you guys have been there, right? With your theater <laughs> backgrounds, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How sure. many roles did you yeah. get that way, guys? I mean, I one, still didn't get the role, but I think it was worth the role. <laughs> and it was your suggestion to go to the couch, but... Uh, yeah, really, there wasn't even any role being offered. Yeah, I was just, yeah. like, really kind of into it. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so he and Mac step outside, and LaRue's like, oh, we got to protect Penny. And, of course, Mac is like, oh, yeah, of course we do. And I find the way that he, like, big brothers around her and then, like, also ask about if she's in a romantic relationship with somebody else to be so annoying... Like, if he wants to get with her, he should get with her. But he's constantly, like, asking her about her boyfriends and just, like, still hanging around. You talking yeah, about this... LaRue? <laughs> no, I'm talking about Mac. Oh, you're talking about Mac. Okay. Mac and Penny should just get together. Uh, do oh. they get together later in the show? Oh, no, no spoilers. No spoilers. Don't even tell them. I don't I mean, even Make know. them watch all the episodes. Well, make them. <laughs> my, and my, that's where I'm at with it right now. Because okay. he's always, like, she's always calling on him and stuff. And he's always, like asking about guys she's dating like dude if you want to date her you should date her like it's weird that he keeps asking about i'm i don't know if this is okay i might be off on a thing but it annoys me no i agree i think mac spends the entirety of like all of this lead up being the most dad character to penny that you've ever yeah. seen so i don't know this it didn't didn't quite sit right with me well yeah. mac has mac has quite the streak uh the sexless hormonalist streak going now after you know the yeah, first season yeah, they took yeah. now they've turned the dial back so far the other way yeah. you could throw the, anything in, the, in front of him yeah. and he's not going to react like yeah. a straight guy in his 30s no he'll, he'll ned flanders it the whole way <laughs> so uh mac goes to check on the broken signage to see if he can find out some information and wintergreen tells him to buzz off uh they go back to the phoenix where pete is telling them that you know it's probably all a coincidence but uh, they look into Wintergreen, the guy who is running this place, and it turns out he has a shit ton of money bet mm. on this performance not going very well in the case of, you know, perhaps the star getting hurt. Oh, a quick note on Wintergreen, played by Robert Donner, definitely familiar to me from the 70s, Mork and Mindy. He was on a bunch of episodes, but a long uh, <clears throat> a character actor with a long history, 130 something credits. Died in 2006, but also on MacGyver three or four times. 
And he, he says, referring to Penny Parker, uh, the only experience she has is delivering singing telegrams. Well, Robert Donner previously appeared in the episode Soft Touch, season two, episode 13, in which Penny was, in fact, employed to deliver singing telegrams. The two actors had scenes together in that episode as well. It didn't, I didn't remember that right off the top of my head, but uh, this guy's got that familiar face and he's been on a handful of, he's, we're going to see him again, I think, on one more episode of MacGyver too. And so Penny goes to confront Wintergreen because he's being a real asshole to her and doesn't believe in her. And she's trying to like stand up for herself. It's just this break means so much to me. You wait till opening night. I'm going to knock their socks off. No. No, you're not. And you want to know why? Because you're an amateur. And nobody pays to see amateurs. Hmm. Cutting. I'm a professional, Mr. Wintergreen. I'm going to prove it to you on that stage. You'll make me a lot happier if you prove it at the box office. You know, Wintergreen, kind of a jerk, really a jerk. But one thing you can got to say about him, always has that, that really fresh breath. <laughs> I don't know what it is about him, but yeah. Minty fresh. I mean, you can cut the guy some slack. Like, he's about to lose the theater his father gave to him. And he's under a lot of pressure. And he thinks that she's a total failure. I mean, but on the other hand... He's got it insured, so if, like, she is a total failure, doesn't it work out just fine anyway? I believe you guys left out my favorite part of that entire scene, which, at the very beginning, when Penny first walks in, she says, Mr. Wintergreen, I think it's time you and I cleared the air. To which Mr. Wintergreen says, what do I look like, a catalytic converter? Yeah, he's got zingers. <laughs> this man has bars. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry I had to cut it for the length of the clip. Mm. But that is it was that's an awkward uh, joke there. But any pe any penny well, takes look like a catalyst. Yeah, I know. Tough. Like you sitting there thinking that's about brutal. that for waiting for somebody to say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so she says it and the guy in his head is like, it's my moment. <laughs> You've been waiting on that um, one for a while. <laughs> I know. Uh, you run home, tell your wife and she's like, oh, that's nice, honey. Oh, you don't understand. Uh, so Penny creeps off back to her room and she gets pursued by somebody with, who has creaking metallic sounds when they chase her. Uh, but mm. she runs away and bumps into Mac, who I guess is just prowling around the theater. Um, <laughs> and she insists that someone was following her and they go to her dressing room and they find a mannequin with a knife stabbed into it with a note attached to it. And that is the end of Axminster 1. Ooh, we don't see what the note says until we come back. Is that what you're... Oh, the Axminster 1. Okay. Uh, oh, no, right. It is, I texted uh, you. It was a... It is. It, the, they do take it off. It says the, it's a threatening poem on the note. I think it was a 25, 26, 27 minute first act for this episode. It's, like it was a full yeah. episode length. Yeah. Crazy long. But it was good. I'm liking it so far. How are you feeling? Uh, it's terrific. I love it. Hey, Amen. Uh, how many times do you think you've seen this episode? Probably three or four times. Okay, okay. And this last viewing, which I imagine you watched in the last couple of weeks or something, how did it hit you then? I watched it two hours ago, and it, <laughs> honestly, my favorite time that I've seen it was the most recent time. Oh, okay. Because yeah. like, you've got the trained focus. You're dissecting mm -hmm. everything now. Okay. I did notice that in the, uh, the scene with uh, when Mac and Penny are looking at the mannequin with the poem, uh, Penny just kind of writes off theater kids in general she's like oh you know they just do that this is a like a theater person <laughs> thing so so the uh the comedy runs a little deep on that whole bit <laughs> so back at the theater mac is finally agreeing that shit has gotten real and now mac is moving into action uh just like in the parker house where he dog shits talk penny the whole way and he finally jumps in on it and LaRue blames Wintergreen, and Wintergreen basically does nothing to deny it and says he's not even going to hire security for Penny. So Max increasingly sure that it's Wintergreen here that's the guy, and he gets some evidence off the sign. And they go back to the Phoenix, and they talk with Pete, who says, this is a professional that has done this job because there's no prints on the knife. And he explains more about Wintergreen having insurance on the show in case it doesn't open. And now, basically all signs point to Wintergreen. Who is also including the one that fell down in the beginning? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I I walked right into that one, and he's being extra <laughs> creepy too. And he's watching Petty Parker from the wings while she <laughs> yeah. while she rehearses with Larue, who bought her a dress and is like hitting on her gratuitously, asking her dinner and stuff. 
What do we think about this uh, this piano moment there with oh. Michael Bars keystrokes? Not exactly uh, matching uh, the the song you're hearing, but what do you think, Eamon? The synthy piano, like this is 1989. <laughs> Grunge is about to explode onto the scene. The musical scene is about to change forever. And this man is still stuck in the last decade. (laughs) Sheriff really hit their peak right there. You can see why (laughs) it's like the last hurrah. That makes sense. Yeah, they're filming this in Vancouver, so they're only a couple hours away from the Seattle, a few hours away from the Seattle grunge scene in 89. But they're choosing to go with... Glam, soft keyboard rock of 84, 83. You know. This Jacques guy needs to get a flannel on him. And she just dances for him, and he's, uh, it's just a, yeah. Uh, and is but, the dress nice? But Wintergreen, no. No, the, I didn't the, think the, so. The dress is nothing. It's okay. I thought the dress but Wintergreen was nice. watching in the shadows, and then again. Homering into the shadows. Sinks, sinks into the shadows backwards. Doesn't turn around and leave, just goes backwards. Still watching. Just lurking. So mm-hmm. Mac is at home testing the evidence and it looks like he's doing drugs because he like puts something <laughs> on a spoon and like has a lighter. And we've seen him do a lot of drugs in recent episodes. So that's why I thought he was freebasing cocaine at this point. And then he like brings it in. St- I mean, which is incredibly yeah. risky. Yeah. Like you're going to light the stuff on fire. You don't even know what it is. You're going to sniff it. So he says it's sulfur, which I guess is kind of a does it MacGyver. Does it MacGyver. I mean, like. Sulfur smells like rotten eggs, so it'd be very identifiable. I don't know what he's looking for in it that he knows that it's sulfur, but it being sulfur tells him something, and you could smell sulfur, so we'll give him one for that one. Okay. Amen. do you know what he's MacGyvering here? Do you know what he's doing here as a detective? And my thought was it would explain it later, but we never got any follow-up. But my thought was that maybe... Since it was a sample from, like, the sign residue, I presumed, like, the broken cable he was looking at earlier, that maybe he was, like, looking for explosives residue. But yeah, we never got that substantiated. Yeah, someone should have looked that up before the episode. That'd be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Penny calls Pete from the Phoenix to come rush to the theater. And he goes there and... Well, he calls, she calls him and he goes there. He says he's going to go there. At the same time, MacGyver is rereading the poem again. And it occurs to him why it's weirdly structured. Because if you read the letters all down the left-hand side of the thing, they all spell out the word Murdoch. Murdoch. Oh, no. It's Murdoch, guys. So it's if not you've gone Jacques all this Leroy. way and have not figured it out, it is now, Murdoch. You, Jeff, this is a Murdoch Is that when episode. it hit you? Is that when you finally got it? Or did you already uh, have it before? Yes, when he brought the highlighter out and dragged the highlighter down the obvious letters, that's when it dawned on me. That's when you got it? No, of course not. Okay, okay. Just oh, my it. God. <laughs> I'm face blind, not a moron. It would be funny if you still didn't get it because he's smelling like <laughs> Murdoch. And then, what's going on here? What does that mean, Murdoch? You know, I found it. I definitely got it the second time because, you know, I already okay. knew. But also, you know. well, that would be funny if you, you didn't get it the second time. Yeah. <laughs> And Pete goes to the theater, and he uh, thinks he finds Luru in the theater, and who mm-hmm. turns around in the chair but Murdoch. Murdoch? Yeah, Murdoch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Murdoch. Yeah. <laughs> this is a call and response game now. Come on, I'm counting on you guys. <laughs> master of disguise, and, master of voices, master of everything. Yeah. And Murdoch sprays him with his cane and knocks him out. Oh, my God. This like is so Murdoch Batman quips, 66. <laughs> quips. Yeah, it is. I, I thought can't it was like He, like, <laughs> brought, and he, like, psh out of his cane yeah. it's awesome pete's like 10 feet away he could easily just he he could winter green his way back out of that <laughs> that gas but he stays there and passes out immediately pete come on pete this is such a batman villain thing because you've got like the riddler you've got you know a riddle saying murdoch and then you've got this like gas you've got the joker mannerisms and like that the uh, the gas coming out of the cane is like a penguin kind of thing because penguin's not an imposing physical thing but he'll knock you out with that gas and like yeah this one's over the top folks this, if you haven't learned by now <laughs> and it was also uh the same knife that murdoch cut the rope with in Wintermaker that he used mm, to pin good. the poem to the dummy Minor detail. Now we like that. Right. So Mac so Mac has a flashback where we get to see the classic MacGyver. And we <laughs> believe Murdoch was still, as far as I knew, he was still falling down the, the widow's peak yeah. there. It, well, yeah. Uh, well, time goes at half speed every time. So he'll never yeah. get there. But that's, uh, is that Axminster 2? That is the end of Axminster 2. Oh, excellent. Okay. Two Axminsters down. Three to go. It's a good time for a time capsule commercial break. Hi, this is MacGyver. And you're listening to Making Fun of MacGyver. 
up all the teachers, time to teach a new way. Maybe then they'll listen to what you have to say. The power of teaching. The world won't get no better. If we're just the power to wake up young minds. The power to wake up the world. Teachers have that power. Reach for the power. Teach. We're recruiting young teachers. Call 1-800-45-TEACH. It's another unforgettable moment with making fun of McGaither. Well, that's fine with me. I just came for lunch. Okay, Mike, uh, can you handle that? Oh, sure thing. Uh, one roasted lamb sandwich and a glass of milk coming right up. No. Okay, how about a good Philly cheesesteak? I've got some steakums right here. No. and Beer battered onion rings. No. Cajun spiced shrimp bake and rumelade and pepper rice. No. Maybe some seared scallops oh. and mushroom risotto with chocolate pistachio truffles. No. Mexican turkey meatballs with pepitas, rice, and spicy cilantro sauce. No. How about some couscous stuffed poblano peppers <laughs> with spinach, raisins from Jeff's home state of California, and tahini dressing? No. <laughs> Keep listening for more unforgettable moments. Got any scotch tape on making fun of MacGyver? Mm, that was RDA's. Uh, that was MacGyver's birthday, and we surprised him. But he was picky about food. You know, ninety-five percent of all the raisins in America are grown like right here outside of my town. Recycling your stats. That only can yeah. you not <laughs> recognize actors. You, yeah, yeah, you said that. Oh my God, you're killing me. There are people killing who me. haven't heard that. They got to know. <laughs> Eamon, were you familiar with where 95% of U.S. raisins are grown? Clearly, I'm not watching the show enough because I was not familiar <laughs> with that fun fact. See? Well, let's this just is get why one more I'm t- right. This is why you got to remind the people. One more time, Jeff. What is that stat again? 95% of all the raisins in the United States are grown in Selma, California, which is like. 20 minutes south of Fresno, where I live. Gee, that's neat. Wow. Now, is that why you chose to live there? Uh, No, it's just a coincidence. It's one of those things like when you live here, you're going to hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the reason that is, is because we're one of the only places where it doesn't rain for long enough for them to dry out. I love the fact that you just answered seriously my question of is is that why you chose to live there? Because ninety five percent of the raisins are grown there. Are those not interesting facts? Did you know that? Did you know we get that little rain, that tiny little amount of rain? I didn't. No, I didn't know that. No. Yeah. Uh, what, are, what are our thoughts on raisins? Mid. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I love raisins, actually. You love raisins? <laughs> Big fan. Oatmeal raisin, great cookie flavor. I have a oh, multiple but... bowls of a raisin trail mix in my pantry right now. I'll tell you the worst raisin is the one where you think you're getting a chocolate chip cookie and it's an oatmeal raisin <laughs> cookie. <laughs> yeah. You think you're getting smooth chocolate and you get that a gooey fruit. It's not great. I think you guys just need to open yourselves up to the possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> People put <laughs> raisins um... in meatloaf? And what about the PSA for teachers? Uh, are we okay with teachers? No. <laughs> I think we're okay with teachers. Again, no, the, the show's be... officially against. <laughs> yeah. Now, Jeff, did you did you almost go into teaching? Hell no. It's funny. It's so funny you asked me that because I was sitting here thinking, I wonder if I should tell the story about how people always ask me if I'm going to become a teacher. <laughs> and my answer is no. Well, you're I so good with of... these raisin facts. The kids would, lo- would love it. <laughs> I can think <laughs> that sounds like a, a hell to me to be in that involved in that. No, there's no chance. Underappreciated, overstressed hell. Yeah. You do get the summers off. Eamon, did you ever consider oh, teaching? I get like 10 Indeed job suggestions for teachers every single day. So to, it would be a lie to say I'm not still considering teaching at this point. Okay. And I, well, I don't did know. that PSA sh- change your views about going into teaching at all? Oh, I I think it just like cemented the fact that I should be going into teaching. And to be yeah. quite honest, <laughs> Jeff, I I think you'd be raising the bar on the teaching. <laughs> 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 That was, that's a great song, by the way. That's a real song. That's uh, "Wake Up Everybody" by Harold Melvin in the Blue Notes with Teddy Pendergrass. That's uh, that song is really cool and inspiring. So I could see it almost made me want to go into teaching during that PSA, but it was only thirty seconds. I didn't get the. I didn't even get to the website actually during that time, but I was considering it. <laughs> would you? As that have song you was ever playing. considered? Beca- would you become a teacher? Have you ever considered it? I did consider it, and just like you guys, I heard people telling me I would be good at it because of the performance yeah. aspect, and I, 
But I think the oldest kids I would want would be like 10 or 11. After that, I don't want those punks <laughs> and throwing the spitballs my, and picking their nose uh, and putting on me and giving me wedgies. My father-in-law had one career in the Navy 20 years and then another career in education 20 years. And what he was was like a like an elementary school teacher and administrator. He worked with like second graders. What did he report back from the field? They're cool? Uh, he loved it. But just to yeah. like echo what you're saying, you're like, he would like, if you wanted to do it, you do do it with younger kids. At the beginning of Axe Mister 3, Murdoch has taken Pete into the creepiest dungeon you've ever seen in your life. And it is like somehow under this theater and there's a pool and there are like <laughs> flames coming out of the pool. And uh, he walks <laughs> Pete in his suit up into a cage and like it's on a pulley and a lever. And uh, he has a monologue. Once upon a time when they needed a man for an assassination, a killing, they would get me. The best man for the job, the best man in the business. Quick, neat, untraceable. Took great pride in my work, made a very good living out of it. Had a lot of fun. Until you and your friend MacGyver came along and spoiled the party. <laughs> well... MacGyver's not going to spoil this party, is he? Do you know what the Paraplanita Americana is, Murdoch? Should I? The common cockroach. And that's what you are. You calling me common, Pete? Always skittering in and out of the darkness. Well, even cockroaches can be stopped. Yeah, Pete! Boom! <laughs> Good Not words. scientific name. <laughs> uh, and then Murdoch pulls a big lever and Pete gets swung out over these pools with flame. Mm. So I don't understand the principle yeah, you of don't... this. Like, is the, whole, exactly. is the whole thing in flames? Or is it like... It's obviously propane that they're using to do the flames, right? On top of some kind Not, of... You, you... You usually want to go one or the other. If you're going to drown someone, then the water is the thing that you base the fear on. If you're going to burn someone, you don't have the fire coming up from water. Because if he falls on top of that fire, he's going to be surrounded by water. Right. So Murdoch, boo on you for that one. But do we think Murdoch wrote this play, this musical, casted it, set up the, did all this stuff, and then built a dungeon underneath the uh, theater? Well, you guys were in theater. How many of these types of dungeons do you see? Do you remember from you know your high school days? Most theaters have one. Oh, okay. I was gonna say you don't know about the under the stage dungeon. Yeah, with the no. flames and the water. No, the weird Christian uh, no. moms but are what? right. We're like sacrificing people down there. It's wild. Okay, it's but, a very important part of casting. See? to be honest, is it like a hazing thing? Like the new the understudies have to do that a little bit. Oh, we don't call it hazing these days. It's more like an initiation. <laughs> yeah, we don't do hazing here. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, it's weird. It's uh, and this is where Pete's starting to sweat, like the the YMCA reference. Upstairs, Penny goes out on stage and like hears the crowd screaming in her head, and uh, it's not clear to me if she hears it in her head or if she hears it over the loudspeakers, but um, she demands whoever it is stop and like turn the music off, and that's when. Mac walks in and talks to her and they go, she's like, go hide in your dressing room because something's going very, very wrong here. Um, he explains that Murdoch is behind it and he's trying to find her and to go hide. And so Murdoch torments Mac around the theater with like hidden speakers and things like that. Like he mm -hmm. puts one in like a, mm -hmm. a sarcophagus, which if you didn't know, you would have learned from the start of the episode. That's what the mummy's crypt is. Yeah. Um, yeah. And basically just, Things to distract him because in Penny Parker's dressing room, she goes to call the police. And of course, there are no phone lines because Murdoch would have taken care of that. And <clears throat> LaRue rolls in. <laughs> and Penny Parker doesn't realize, of course, that LaRue and Murdoch are the same person. So mm -hmm. also, if you didn't realize here, now this is, is where Jeff discovers it. Now is the time because he wasn't sure about it spelling Murdoch down. He said, "Like, yeah. okay, I could just be an allusion to something yeah. else." But so he rises from his wheelchair dramatically, and she scratches him across the face, and he's got a latex mask covering up his whole scarred face, and he like mm. peels it off of his face. Disturbing. All, yeah, it was yeah. awesome because Michael Debar <laughs> doesn't have scars. So it's a mask on top of a mask. Like they mm -hmm. put the scars down True. and then put the thing over Inception that. Inception level um, special effects by the MacGyver yeah. team. 
So, Eamon, you're seeing this episode at what, 15, 16, 17 years yeah. old? What would you say? I, I would be lying if I didn't say I jumped a little bit. Like, that was, <laughs> that was spooky. That was gorgeously done horror. Yeah. It's good. It's mm-hmm. good body yeah. horror. Mac is prowling around like an idiot, and he finds Wintergreen has been murdered. So Murdoch is going. The full the uh-huh. full stage is set, and he turns around and he sees Murdoch on stage holding Penny Parker at I believe knife point, and he mocks him and then disappears off the stage down a set of stairs. And that is the end of Axminster Three. You guys picking up on a healthy amount of uh, MacGyver's being said in this episode? <laughs> uh, Murdoch pretty much can't say a sentence without dropping. I hadn't the name noticed, there. but thanks for the heads up. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Nope. I'm sure I, I put good money. Eamon's going to beat you on, on the guessing of the number. There. <laughs> that goes right That's by me. That's a bold man. guess. <laughs> so now, now the episode's getting real and the action's getting intense because Penny yeah, has both so. Murdoch and Pete at the same time down in this dungeon. And he puts Penny and Pete together. And of course, Pete's not very happy to see that they're both caught. And Murdoch mm-hmm. like slowly sets up a trap, even though MacGyver would be running at him with full speed, where... It's like a wire and the wire comes around and like if the door is open, the wire is going to trip the the switch and Pete is going to fall into the flame water and die. And so that's the trap that's going to be waiting for MacGyver. And um, so Mac shows up down there and Pete warns him and he's like, you can't come in here, Mac. You can't. But Murdoch has other plans because he pulls another lever and the floor underneath Mac on the other side in the other room starts to rise like a press like it's from Indiana Jones where he's going to get squished Mm -hmm. Murdoch Mm -hmm. has like rigged a pressure floor under this one spot where MacGyver is now stuck and if he opens the door Pete gets dropped into the water the flame water so what's he going to do, guys? Yeah, do we know why Pete falling into flame water would uh, be a death sentence? Uh, well, why is that supposed to be a bit? Oh, no, I, I got a little wet and, oh, that was hot, but I'll just swim over to the side. What's the deal with that? Yeah, I thought so, too. Like, I figured if you, like, <laughs> if it drops, like, maybe you can just, like, go restart the wench. Like, it's just pulling the release. You could, like, wench him back up. I guess uh, they'll hold the, the, the cage down below the surface, and then he'll drown. But, but yeah. then what's the point of the flames? So is I think it'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the parallels between, like, this under-the-stage, like, dungeon with flames in the water and the Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. Because there's that whole part where they go well, under the, the I'll leave that to you, uh, theater boy. <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> Is that it? Or do that you have was, more on the That film? was all I had to say. Okay. <laughs> just, to, just a brief I aside. I wanted you to show the parallels between this and Phantom of the Opera. Because, that, the Phantom um, lives under the theater, dude. You thought we were joking about the dungeons? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, Mac like takes his knife and a belt or like a string from his jacket and a piece of wood and takes the Swiss Army knife out, opens up the can opener part of it, ties it to the string, takes the wood takes the wood out of the doorway through this little tiny window that's at the top of the door and uses the can opener on the end of the Swiss Army knife to release the cable from the switch so that he can open the door mm-hmm. without Pete dropping to the ground. All of this while the floor is rising up from beneath him and is preparing to squish him. The floor is lava and water. You could have just open the door and then just like use the wench to get Pete out of the water. But then it wouldn't be a MacGyverism. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm sitting on well, here. Well, I guess Jeff is not calling it a MacGyverism. He hasn't I, indicated that I should play it. So I, that's just... what I was just getting to. That's what I was just getting to. What do you to. think? Well, I gave him one for being able to smell sulfur. So let's at least give him a second <laughs> one for this. Because there have been so few. Does it MacGyver? Sure, why not? Yes. But I don't understand why you would do it like this. You know? Like, the risk is so high. Because as they show in the episode, like, it, the floor breaks the door handle like you can't get out after that nothing i'm just still thinking about pete dropping the scientific name for the common cockroach so i can't <laughs> focus on the rest of this episode his suit too yeah. just perfect so the flames aren't that hot yeah. he's just standing there yeah uh yep. penny pleads with murdoch not to attack her but he's being a big old creep what are you gonna do i still need you penny parker now one of them is coming out of there alive which one do you think it's going to be? Please, Jacques LaRue wouldn't do this. There is no Jacques LaRue. Yes, there is. He writes 
beautiful music. And he's sensitive and charming and romantic. There's cut there. Only we'd met in another lifetime. You're gonna kill my best friends? And you're saying that I love you. That's exactly what I'm saying. MacGyver's right. You are insane. Yeah, Penny. Welcome to the party, Penny. Did we just find out that the, the saddest thing in all this is that Penny Parker considers MacGyver and Pete Thornton her best friends? <laughs> she just said that. She's <laughs> like 25. Best friends? What 25-year-old woman isn't best friends with a, a 70 <laughs> or a 60-something and a 38-year-old man? Who you occasionally see for crazy adventures, but that's it. I mean, that's Do your best Do you know how many 25-year-olds I know? I'm 40. Do you know how many 25-year-olds I know? None. Well, I guess one. Hmm. <laughs> this one right here. I, yeah. I, un, I know. So my uh, the triathlon team I'm a member of has a lot of members who are over the age of 35. So I, I would say a lot of my close friends are actually in the MacGyver age bracket. It's not so much the age thing. It's just that she doesn't yeah. spend time with Pete Thornton. How could she? Can, she barely knows the guy and MacGyver a few times. Right? They have some adventures, but that's her best friend. Come on, Penny. Did you grow up with somebody? So Mac goes to free Pete, and then he goes after Penny, and Murdoch does the thing where he impersonates a woman's voice, allegedly, and people <laughs> fall for this, even though it's like not really him doing it. And he's got Penny Parker, and this time he's got a gun. And he points the gun at MacGyver. He does a little bit of supervillain monologuing, and Penny Parker makes good on her promise earlier in the episode to get her kick right kicks yeah. the gun out of Murdoch's hand yeah. and they uh, he goes and kicks it out of the way and now Murdoch and Mac are hand to hand fist fighting in the dungeon underneath the theater. Mac's got the or Murdoch's got the knife. He's like slashing and cutting at Mac and um, eventually Murdoch does anyone want to say anything? Pete just yells Murdoch and that, <laughs> I guess distracts Murdoch for a second. They're trading punches. MacGyver's losing. He's getting his he's getting mm -hmm. his butt kicked. He kicks Mac to the ground, who winds up near like a control panel, and Mac yanks this control panel cable out of the uh, out of the wall and Socket, jabs yeah. jabs it into Murdoch, electrocuting him, causing him to yell MacGyver and fall <laughs> into the pool of firewater behind them. Why did this shock him? Do we know? I mean, it was plugged into the wall. Maybe it was like a pool deck around like the water, so there was some water to conduct the electricity. I don't know. I mean, you Plunged know how it is. You just wall. plug things in the wall and things get electrocuted. Isn't that how it works? Okay. It's a big cable. I did enjoy how long he kept the MacGyver for. Uh, <laughs> he screamed it. It was about nine, ten seconds. Yes. I was going to say, does it beat the uh, the sheriff song note hole? Oh, that's a good one. That's a close call. Yeah. So Pete, Penny, and Mac are all looking at the pool. And Penny says that Jacques would have been so proud of her kick that she got right. <laughs> Already having forgotten that Jacques and Murdoch <laughs> were the same person. Because then she goes, oh, yeah, Jock right. was my third best friend. I know. And now he's gone. <laughs> uh, anyway, and that is the end of Axe Minister 4. And there's only one Axe Minister left and only one cut left. I still can't believe that Jock was this Murdoch person the whole time. I mean, how could somebody change his voice and appearance so completely? Well, that was his specialty, being somebody else. It's almost sad. You really think he's dead? I think it's a matter of wishful thinking on my part. I'll be happy when I can close this file. Don't get your hopes up. They drained the underground pool. Don't tell me no Murdoch. There was a broken sewer line connected to the pool. Not big enough for any normal human being to get through. Murdoch is not normal. That's for sure. If he's alive, he'll be back. Well, that's a scary thought. He really had me fooled. You know, he made me feel like I did have talent. Penny, you do. I saw you on stage. You're terrific. You mean it? Yeah. Oh, which reminds me. MacGyver asked me to bring this back from the theater. My star. You might want to hang on to that. I think you're going to need it soon. Oh, MacGyver. <laughs> oh, Penny. <laughs> oh, boy. It's funnier than I remember. Oh, man, it's so weird. And all I could get out of that is, like, MacGyver 
it's the clash of like I've thought of MacGyver as like Penny's dad for this entire time, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like we still have that that inkling of chemistry from like when he was talking with Murdoch way earlier in the episode. So I don't know what was up with the writers. <laughs> <laughs> We've uh, recapped and ridiculed this one, but now let's uh, get our review scores ready: zero to ten mullets as we talk about Cleo Rocks. <laughs> It's fantastic. Uh, you know, the Murdoch stuff is ridiculous. Though I love the whole set piece. It's really ridiculous. It's got so much crazy things that are going on in it. There's like the spray cane. There's the traps. There's the insane over-the-top director who has somehow won Penny's heart. Uh, there's a dungeon that's involved in it. There's a fake musical that somehow Murdoch plays off. There's MacGyver being a total dork about it until he draw, finds it on the note. It's great. It's a nine mullet affair. <laughs> okay. I thought this is one of one of the most entertaining episodes of MacGyver in season four, if not the whole show. I was riveted from start to finish. I loved all the theatrics and I loved like the complicated Rube Goldian, Goldbergian mousetrap situation that Murdoch had at the end. And I would have to give it 9 out of 10 mullets. All right. Well, um, I'm not too off, far off from you guys. Uh, we can put another one in the So Silly It's Great category for me. The setting of Penny Parker being in a musical with a disguised Murdoch as the director is just ridiculous. It gets sillier and more sinister, right, as the episode goes on. Pete dangling over flaming water, which, again, I think is an oxymoron. But um, Murdoch leaving the room to go chill with Penny in the hallway is very... Uh, uh, very Batman 66 me, right? You could just watch this happen, but no, let me go talk with Penny in this hallway where I don't see what happens. <laughs> I'm sure it'll work out. <laughs> you got the, you got the face putty in the, in the fingernails. That's an ailment we've all suffered through on like a dry skin winter morning, right? You know, the feeling. And of course the elephant in the room, uh, no, I'm not talking about Pete, but I'm talking about the absurdity of, uh, the MacGyver's being said that adds to my bonus point, but I'm a little, a little bit lower than you guys. Still, it all adds up to a very enjoyable and uh, memorable episode. So I've got eight mullets out of ten. All right, so, uh, Jeff, you add up your nine yeah. and my eight. Yeah. And divide by two, uh-huh. and that gives us... Six. This one's rated nine out of ten mullets. Wowie, wow, wow. It's a nine. And that is our second nine of the season. After what? What's the other one? Um, Blood Brothers. Yeah, that's the one. I mean, that's going to be the one I'm always thinking about. That's our third nine ever. We've got the Assassin, Blood Brothers, and now Cleo Rocks. You know, I don't know if I'll ever get out of a 10, but you could definitely could not give this a 10 because there are no like true MacGyverisms in it. Yep. A yep. true 10 would have to have at least one. Let's crunch the numbers now. This is where we count up the MacGyverisms and uh, see all the, how many times they said MacGyver. Jeff, the MacGyverisms, what, two for two? Well, you kind of set me up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, two for two. Sorry, I'm skipping past the thing. Yes, two for two. He does the thing with his knife and he smells some uh, sulfur. Now, how many times did anyone say MacGyver here? Um, let's have Jeff go first. You set me up earlier in the episode by saying something to the effect of there's a lot of them. So I'm going to go with 27. Amen. I was going to say 36. Amen. No, I'm you got the victory, <sighs> but you were still 10 away it was said 46 times, guys. Jesus. 46 ties the record for second most times ever said. Uh, excessive. And here it just, MacGyver, I don't think anyone's ever said it as much as Murdoch says it. Here's just a sampling of just Murdoch from the episode. Ah, MacGyver. 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 Monsieur MacGyver. Remember me, MacGyver! Say goodbye, MacGyver! MacGyver! Until you and your friend MacGyver came along and spoiled the party. MacGyver's not going to spoil this party, is he? I've anticipated everything MacGyver's creative little mind can come up with. I'm saving that job for MacGyver. I love that cut. I'm up here, MacGyver. You're burning hot now, MacGyver. What's the matter, MacGyver? It's showtime, MacGyver. This is what we've wanted for a long time, MacGyver. This is what we've both wanted for a long time, MacGyver. MacGyver! They're both right, MacGyver. It's up to you, MacGyver. It's either deep fried Thornton or pancake MacGyver. I knew you had it in you, MacGyver. MacGyver! 
know, I just, it's too much now. After the 56 with Collision Course, I can't be, you know, 46 would normally make me stop and do the super cut, but I just like, I can't do it anymore with this. It's too much work. <laughs> but there's, there's Murdoch saying it 22 of the 46 times. I don't think we've ever had one person say it as much as Murdoch said it in this episode, though. Uh, what was Quail's number in season one? Oh, true. I guess, yeah, it's very similar to Quail, right? Because anything where you can't see the guy and he's talking from a, a yeah. PA system. Yeah, right. How about the most make fun of a moment? What was the silliest thing here? Gas cane. Ooh, gas, gas cane. cane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where he wheels around and sprays him. With I had like a three-way tie between Penny Parker saying esophagus instead of sarcophagus. The the lanky backup dancers <laughs> and the catalytic converter <laughs> okay. line. We need to clear the air. Uh, We're my top three. Well, if I'm going <laughs> to strip down and do peanut butter in the belly button, you know I'm choosing the backup. The hunky henchman. Oh, my God. what She got ripped off so bad uh, of having like two beefcake. Now, I know you got to have dancers, right? So they got to be good dancers. Maybe they got to be a little more agile and nimble. But especially the one guy on the left, just like, oh, my God, that was looking like me in high school, like 110 pounds, like 5'11", and have no business being around a sexy woman like, you know, Penny Parker. Get that lad a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that wraps it up. Well, what happened to that, uh, that, that show that oh, – is this it? Is this that show thing that we were talking about? What's going on here? It's What's Up With Mac. Talking all things McGavin. Tonight, from the resident tourist blog, Eamon McCullough. From making fun of MacGyver, the scientist, Jeffrey Hess. And from the Phoenix Foundation, Pete Thornton. And now, your homicidal maniac of a host, Murder. I woke up this morning and I got out of bed. Dressed up like a woman, put a wig on my head. I'm hell-bent on revenge and you know that's a fact. So don't be afraid, just tell me what's up with Mac. Ooh-wee. What's up with Mac? What's up with Mac? Ooh-wee. What's up with Mac? What's up with Mac? What's up? With MacGyver! Oh yes, thank you, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, thank you for joining us on What's Up With Mac. Well, we are very excited to talk about my dear friend MacGyver. We've got some great guests, it's going to be a lovely chat, I think you'll agree. Might get a little scary. Hmm? Might, might, might get a little hairy. Might get a little starey. I could be anywhere. It's gonna be sweary. Flary, Larry, Perry, Underwary. I'm Sari. I should get the electric cherry. Ooh wee. What's up with Mac? What's up with Mac? Ooh wee. What's up with Mac? What's up with Mac? What's up with Mac? What's up? Tell me what's up now. If I kill you, I'm probably gonna snap a Polaroid and hang it up in a real creepy like bulletin board. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Uh, from uh, the resident tourist blog, Eamon McCullough. Uh, hey, Murdoch. Thanks for having me. And also from making fun of MacGyver, Jeffrey Hess. Yes, yes, it's my um, pleasure to be here. And uh, from the Phoenix Foundation, my dear friend, Mr. Pete Thornton. Do you know what the Paraplanita Americana is? All right, very well. Now, okay, Eamon, I understand you're a triathlete. Uh, tell me, is it uh, harder to train for a triathlon or to trick MacGyver to into his doom? Well, it uh, it depends. I I feel like you can you can do a lot of a lot of running and swimming and biking, but MacGyver, wait wait wait, what's what's that noise? I don't hear a thing. Uh, oh, all right. Well, as I was saying, like you have to focus on the swim, the but there it is again. It's like a hi hat or symbol or something. Do you, Jeff? Do you hear it? Oh, I'm hearing it, and it's really rude if you ask me. You're trying to talk. 
and there's like somebody tapping out on a drum set or something. No, 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 I don't hear a thing. Go, go ahead, Eamon, tell me more about a triathlon in MacGyver. Ah, well, okay, so as I was saying, training for a triathlon takes a lot of willpower, a the lot of- The power of will. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you have to have a lot of discipline, even just say for the biking component, you have to- Better pedal harder now, yeah. Hey, hey. What kind of interview is this? I'm just trying to answer your question. I don't mean to cut you off, but this must be said! Ooh-wee! What's up with Mac? What's up with Mac? Ooh-wee! What's up with Mac? Well, that was something. I don't know if that's... Yeah, we're getting preempted for that. Yeah. I... <laughs> we can't match that. Yeah. Good song and dance number. But, um, okay, well, we're glad to be back, but let's wrap it up. Um, Eamon... Thank you so much for joining us here. Your thoughts on uh, sitting in the co-host chair for an episode. Fellas, it was an honor and a privilege. Love to be here. Looking forward to the season five episode. And to anyone who isn't a Patreon patron, I would 1000% recommend it because this is (laughs) an out-of-body experience. I've been listening to this show for how long? And to finally be a part of an episode is just unreal so thanks so much for having me (laughs) no it's it's been a thrill having you yes i love it uh i always rave when listeners come on and people do the patreon patron stuff it's my favorite perk i love the energy people bring and everyone who's come on has been fantastic so thank you for your time tonight all right jeff let's uh give a huge thanks now to our other patrons who've inspired us to bring our a games like claire in new jersey who wonders, how is it that MacGyver can defuse bombs with paper clips but can't keep a girlfriend alive longer than two episodes? Go to deadfictionalgirlfriendsreport.com for answer to that and more. Christian in Norway, who taught us that AHA is not a one-hit wonder. Simon in Sweden, a fine young man who knows a good episode of MacGyver when he sees one. He actually just bumped up his level of patronage, and he will now be joining us uh, in the guest host chair at some point. Thank you so much, Simon. Eamon in Philadelphia, who's present with us tonight as one of his perks for being a patron. We should make him read his tongue twister of a, of a shout I, I thought about that, but I didn't know if he had it open. Passionate bicyclist and triathlete, he asked all of us to please support local bike lane and pedestrian friendly infrastructure projects and legislation. <laughs> That's script written by LaRue? I don't know. It takes me back to my public radio days. How's it going, Eamon? Well, Philadelphia just approved a project to make Walnut Street, which is a big east-west arterial, uh, a bike lane with one lane of traffic and have some more traffic calming measures. Great. The bike lane on 15th Street, where I used to live, which is a big north-south road, has been fully, like, protected and got green paving and painting on it. Great. It's not a ton, but it's a step forward, so things are going better. High five. We did that. We built that. Yes. By promoting and You're making welcome. fun of a guy, right? You're welcome. You're welcome, Eamon. I'm okay. sure our check is in the mail, and thanks. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Gary in Kelowna, BC, unofficially our first ever fan and a making fun of MacGyver Hall of Fame member. And Henry in from Mustio, Finland, who's an IT specialist, a part-time farmer, and a full-time friend of ours now. And Timothy Haggerty out of New Jersey, a recent patron. Timothy, thank you so much for your support. We're always looking for new friends. Say hi to us on the socials and email us if you like and send a little uh, voice clip. We'll play it on the show, makingfunofmacgyver at gmail.com. And if you want to throw something in the tip jar and get the sweet perks that come with it, we'd really appreciate it. Pick a tier that works for you at patreon.com slash MacGyver. But above all else, keep coming back because we're going to keep making fun of MacGyver. So for Jeff and Eamon, I'm Sam saying thanks again so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Peace. Do you know what the Paraplanita Americana is, Murdoch? Should I? The common cockroach. And that's what you are. You calling me common, Pete? Always skittering in and out of the darkness. Well, even cockroaches can be stopped. (laughs) 